Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our um, info session. Our speaker this morning is Dr. Robin Morgan. She is the chair of our state selection committee for Bassett. So I think you are in for a treat. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, we are a small group, so please feel free to interrupt me, ask questions along the way. My plan for today is to go through the process that the statewide selection committee uses when evaluating dossiers. And then at the end, to talk a little bit about some of the consistent problems that we see with dossiers and what we would prefer to see. Um, so hopefully that, and feel free to ask any questions, or if I'm not addressing what you want me to address, I hope that we have time to address those issues as well. All right. Um, we have a specified procedure for what we do statewide. So everyone is, who is on the statewide selection committee is informed as to the, this procedure, and this is the procedure that we follow every single year. Hi, come on in. Your part. Um, first, the office, Kim and Allie, once the dossiers get to them, they put all the dossiers in a format that we can read them online. It's in a protected site. And every single member of the statewide selection committee, including myself as chair, reads every dossier. So if there are 60 dossiers, everybody reads all 60. And as the dossiers are read, we have a rubric, which I'm going to go through with you. And each person ranks the person using that rubric. So when we so everybody reads the dossiers. It's not just people from your campus who are reading the dossiers, or it's not people from other campuses only who are reading your dossier. Everybody reads the dossier. I then assign one person to each candidate. Now, the way I do that is that I would make sure that no that the, that the statewide representative from the Northwest campus is not given a Northwest candidate. To read, to be the person assigned to their case. That person who's assigned isn't an advocate for that candidate. Uh, but, but what they do is during our statewide meeting, they kick off the, the discussion of the candidate by simply summarizing the person's case. They summarize what they see as being the strengths of the case, and they summarize what they see as being the weaknesses of the case. So the person that's assigned to each candidate provides a summary, and that starts our discussion. When we get to each person, the first thing that we do is we provide an overall ranking, and I'll share that with you in a minute. And we do that first before any discussion, just to see where the committee stands on each candidate. Then we review the case. So for every candidate, we talk about um, their strengths in the case, the weaknesses in their case, and any other issues about the case. And that is a time when the state, the representative from the individual campus can tell us something. For example, on my campus, uh, at IU Southeast, we don't, the student evaluation of teaching documents belong to the faculty member. That means that we do not have departmental disciplinary or school-wide averages for the student evaluation of teaching. So that's very important because some campuses, I'm not sure about your campus, but some campuses, they do provide averages. They provide discipline averages or school averages or even campus-wide averages on the student evaluation of teaching. So sometimes on the statewide committee, hi, come on in, people from those campuses are confused as to why people from IU Southeast don't have Chris. those average data. And so the, the statewide person, the representative from your campus, can explain those sorts of things to the statewide committee. Does that make sense? OK. Um, once we review the case, so we review every single person's case, we then vote. And it's a simple vote, either full admission to FACET, um, Full admission means that we send you a letter saying, congratulations, you've been admitted to FACET. 
Uh, the second option is that we can vote that this person is really good, but there might be some things missing from their dossier. And so we ask them to please revise and resubmit. So those individuals get a letter where the statewide committee says, look, they need to reflect more, they need to do this, they need to do this, and that's what we put in the letter. So that's a revise and resubmit letter. Um, the third type of letter is a simple rejection. We rarely send out simple rejection letters. Those are very short. They tend to be one line. Thank you very much for applying to, to FACET. The candidates were very strong this year. Unfortunately, you did not, um, you were not one of those who were admitted to FACET. So if you get a three-line letter, that's very different than getting a please revise and resubmit letter. The please revise and resubmit basically is saying, look, you may be a wonderful teacher. We think you might be a wonderful teacher, but there's something missing from the dossier. And I think that's really hard for people to understand, is that when I read a dossier from another campus, I don't know these people. I don't know you very well. I don't know what you do that has made your campus select you to be submitted for a FACET membership. The only thing I know about you is what you put in that dossier. And some of us are more comfortable or less comfortable blowing our own horn. Uh, I'm not real comfortable uh, blowing my own horn. And so I remember when I went up for FACET, the, my mentor said, look, Robin, you know, you do this, you do this, you do this. Why isn't any of that in your dossier? I said, well, you know, <laughs> I didn't want to put all that in there. But I, nobody on the committee knows what you've done unless you describe it. So that's really important. It's n getting that please revise and resubmit doesn't mean that the statewide committee thought that you were a bad teacher. It means that there wasn't enough in that dossier to convince everybody on the committee. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the letters, I write all the letters. Hi, come on in. So I'm pretty familiar with the letters. Um, I write the letters, but the letters are designed by the statewide selection committee. So everything that I put in that letter has been approved by the statewide selection committee. So that's one of the, so when we meet on that day, that's kind of what we do. And it's a long process. Uh, we tend to have anywhere between 35 and 60 dossiers in a particular year. It varies from year to year how many dossiers we have. And the statewide selection committee process, we do it in one day, and it typically takes us anywhere, anywhere between four and eight hours. Um, so we are there until we get it done. Um, and so it can sometimes be a very long day, um, but it's a very important day. And we have talked about not doing the review of each candidate because it takes so long, but we do. Uh, we feel it's very important that each candidate gets a full review. So we talk about each candidate's strengths and weaknesses. What I want to do is I want to go through the rubric that we use so you can see what's important to us and how we make those evaluations. Now I said that we begin by recording rankings. Right here we record rankings. So the ranking that we record is an overall rating. This is based on the rubric. <coughs> Basically, we give each candidate a one, a two, or a three. And that sounds simple, doesn't it? A mm -hmm. one, two, three. Well, you guys have been around faculty long enough to know that nobody can do a one, two, or three. Mm -hmm. So we get 1.25, <laughs> 2.5, uh, 1.75, all this sort of stuff like that. But in general, what we're trying to do is get some sense of overall, how does each representative feel about this particular candidate? One would be an ideal match. We have a representative from every campus on the statewide selection committee, and then I serve as chair. As chair, I do not vote, which makes me ideal to come to campuses and talk about this process because you can't be mad at me, I didn't vote. Okay. The only time I vote is when there's a tie. And so far, I've been lucky enough to um, make sure there's never been a tie, that I always have enough consensus that there's never a time that I have to vote. 
Typically what happens is that we will have consensus the first time around. So when we, so when we do that initial ranking, you'll have five ones. And maybe the rest of them will be twos. Rarely do we have a situation where we have a couple of ones, a couple of twos, and a couple of threes. That just doesn't happen. Um, I, th I can think of one time in all the years I've been on, on the statewide selection committee where we've had that type of discrepancy. It's usually pretty consistent. Um, so a one is an ideal match, a two is a possible facet match, and a, th and a three would be not appropriate for facet. So how do we come up with those numbers? What we do is we have a rubric, and if you've <coughs> looked at the handbook, this rubric is in the handbook. I think it's a Appendix A, maybe I'm not sure. What, I'm not sure what appendix it is, but it's in the handbook. And several years ago, we we made the decision to try to make this as transparent a process as possible. So we put the rubric in there. We put all the directions in terms of what we get in the handbook so that you would be able to actually see what it is that we're evaluating you on. Because it seems to me, uh, when I teach, I tell my students exactly what it is that I want them to be able to do, and then my rubric matches that. So we wanted the same thing for the statewide selection <coughs> committee, that you have the rubric, you know exactly what we want, and then that way you know how we're evaluating you on the rubric. So there are several sections, four sections, and the first section is called Excellence in Teaching and Learning. And this is something really important that I think sometimes we don't do. Thought I heard something. I'll get it. <laughs> okay. UPS guy. Thank you. <coughs> like, okay, do I answer the door? Um, FACET is about excellence in teaching. It's not about being a good teacher. It's about being an excellent teacher. So the bare minimum for getting into FACET is being is an excellence in teaching. So we kind of go around and around about this. You know, is there enough in the dossier that pushes them over the top from good to excellent? And that's somewhat subjective in terms of is it good or is it excellent? So we have some um, some criteria here that try to help us push that from good to excellent. But that's the real crux of the matter. Nothing else matters. The letters of rec don't matter. Uh, your scholarship of teaching and learning doesn't matter. Your leadership doesn't matter. If you haven't convinced us that you're excellent in teaching, that is the crux of the matter. So that has to be there. And many times we see these people that they you know, are completely, that complete dossiers about their leadership efforts, and they look like they're wonderful. But I don't see any indication of what they're like as a teacher, of how they interact with their students, of how, uh, of what their student learning outcomes might be. I don't see that. And so if we don't have that type of, of information, that person's not gonna get in facet. And they may be a wonderful teacher, but it's not in the dossier. And all we can look at is what's in the dossier. So what's contained in those pages, that's it. I can't go online, I can't talk to your friends, I can't do anything like that. Um, it has to be in the dossier. So the first thing that, top of the list, in documenting that you're an excellent teacher is evidence of student learning. Um, we have to have evidence of student learning. Hey, come on in. They're not here. They're okay, they're next door. <laughs> Sounds like they're here. <laughs> it's right next door. And we're going to be talking more about this a little bit later when I talk about some of the problems that we have. Is that when I'm talking about student learning, I'm talking about that you set a goal for your class, um, something that you want your students to be able to do, and then you're providing the evidence that your students actually were able to do that. To me, that's student learning. And so that's the sort of thing that we're looking for. 
Okay, well, what, huh? Go ahead. I mean, it would be really nice to set up pre-test and post-test with your students, and you could maybe show that from day one they didn't know the major concepts, and then you could show that in a final exam period they mastered these concepts. I mean, something like that would go over pretty big, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. Let me show you. I'll just go right here to this. I'm skipping around now, but I do that all the time. <laughs> um, what you're talking about is the ideal thing, is having sort of a pre-test, post-test, based upon your learning outcomes. We all have student objectives or learning outcomes on our syllabi. How do you know whether the students are actually meeting those? I assume that you're doing some sort of assessment. So if you had a pre-test, that looked at those learning outcomes, uh, assessment of critical thinking. And then you had a post-test that looked at the same thing. That would be an ideal thing to be able to, to document student learning in your class. Not everybody has done that. Not everybody has thought ahead to having a pre-test and a post-test. You don't have to. One of the things that I've seen done is they look at the performance on each test. <coughs> so. If, for example, the learning outcome was that you wanted the student to be able to apply concepts to novel scenarios, well, then on each test, there were certain questions that asked students to do that. You could look at their performance on the first test on those items. Let's say that they were 25% uh, of the students succeeded on the first test on those items. On the second test, 57% succeeded. And by test three, 86% of the students succeeded. You've just demonstrated that the students learned how to do this over the course of the semester. And this would be wonderful data. We would be very pleased with, with these types of data. Um, and the person did not necessarily have thought ahead to have a pretest and a post-test. But they had questions on their tests, on their regular exams, that assessed these, con assessed these skills. And I think all of us do that. I think all of us um, are trying to assess our learning outcomes. So you have that, you have those data. What you have to do is figure out how to organize them, how to present them, so that you're making the argument that your students are learning. Now, one of the things I hear all the time, and I see in the dossiers all the time, is the use of the set data to make the argument that your students are learning. The SAT data, in my opinion, does not equal student learning. When the students say, for example, that I am knowledgeable, okay, that really doesn't say anything about their learning. Or this is, you know, this is the best class I've ever taken. How does that tell me anything about how much they've learned? Or my teacher was enthusiastic. That just doesn't really tell me anything about how much the students learned in that class. So one of the mistakes that people make quite frequently is that they rely on the set data, the student evaluation, the teaching data. Sorry about that. Um, they rely on the student evaluation, the teaching data to make the argument that they are, that their students are learning. That doesn't cut it. Um, it just isn't sufficient to make that argument very strongly. Now, one of the things you could do is have different set data. You have different set questions rather than some of those standard ones. If you have questions that actually do assess student learning, that would be much more powerful. Yeah. What about the question, I learned a lot in this class. On the set data, there's a question, how much did you learn in the course? And the student says, oh, I just learned tremendously. Yeah. Does that work? I would say that's very weak. Okay. It, but that at least it gets to. It, it does get to it. I would be more impressed with. something a little bit more specific. During this class, I learned about X, or about Y, or how X and Y relates to one another, strongly agree. But even that's a little bit more specific. But just saying, I learned a lot, okay. <laughs> I guess that's student learning, but it's not very strong student learning. Okay. And if that's the only thing you have, you'd probably get the revise and resubmit letter. And we would say, we would like to see more evidence of student learning. Okay. And so there are lots of different ways to document student learning. Some uh, disciplines have national tests that they use. And those would be perfectly appropriate. 
uh, to include under student learning. Um, every discipline is different. And so you may have additional ways of documenting student learning. I definitely think if you have a certain percentage of your students that are going to graduate school or going to medical school or law school, um, that's definitely documentation of student learning as well. Because it's not just one way to document student learning. There's multiple ways to document student learning. But we have to see that you've documented that. That's the very first thing under that, um, are you an excellent teacher? Can I? Mm -hmm. Susan? For instance, in education, in order for them to get to the advanced section of um, it, you know, getting certified, they have to pass the um, PPST. So they have to take the discipline part after they get into the advanced methods. So if I was the advanced methods person, I would be able to say that X percent of my students in an S whatever class where they were able to pass the um, PPST subject specific test with a 80 percent or better? That would, would be that good. Be good data that would be good data but, but remember, I have, I'm not an education faculty member. Mm -hmm. so it's but important. that's a national test, it that's is. what I'm saying. But, but, what, but what you would need to do is make sure you explain why we should care. Okay. Why we should take those data as evidence that you've done something to help the students learn. Okay. So explain it to us. I see. Okay. okay. Don't expect the, the statewide committee to understand all the intricacies of your discipline. So the fact that the test is tied into the standards mm -hmm. and that they have met the standards and then have demonstrated the standards on the exam is evidence. Connect that, the dots for me. Yeah. Don't go okay. from A to G. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'm pretty good. If, 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 you know, if you go from A to C, I'll probably get it. But if you go from A to G, you've lost me. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm being somewhat um, joking here in the sense that I've been on the committee long enough. I've read dossiers from enough different disciplines that I probably can go from A to F. But sometimes things come up and we really don't have a clue what they're talking about. And that's why people get the revise and, and resubmit letter. Because it, it may be in there, but we can't understand it. And we, you know, and, the, and there are people from every campus, but that doesn't mean there are people from every discipline. <coughs> All right. So that's student learning. That is a biggie. Um, that is one of the two issues that is most likely to cause a candidate not to be admitted to the FAFSA. Because people are not documenting student learning. They're just giving us set scores, student evaluation or teaching scores, and thinking that that's student learning. Um, the strengths of the course or teaching portfolio is important. What we want in that portfolio, we want to know what you believe about student learning. What is your philosophy? And how is that philosophy demonstrated by the choices you've made in your teaching? So if you claim that you really want the students to be able to critically think, you want them to be able to do X and Y, but then all of your assessment and everything you talk about is unrelated to critical thinking or X or Y. That doesn't make any logical sense. So we're looking for some consistency between your philosophy of teaching, what you believe about how students learn, and what you actually do. That's really important. We love it when we see that you're willing to take risk. And sometimes those risks are not going to pan out. Sometimes you're going to try something and it doesn't work. And how do you know it doesn't work? Because you collect data of some type. You listen to the students' comments. You have a peer review. And then you go back and you try something else. That sort of a process should be reflected in your course or teaching portfolio. So we're looking for what have you, you know, how have you developed as a teacher? And once again, you don't have to make yourself seem like everything you do is perfect. Mm. We've been there, okay? Mm -hmm. I teach. <laughs> there are some days where I try something and it bombs. It is not an effective thing. But how do I know it's not effective? I get feedback. And then what do I do? Do I keep on doing the ineffective thing? No. 
I go back and I make changes and I collect more data and I keep on doing that until I find a way to get across that topic or get across that idea in an effective manner. And I think that's what we're looking for in terms of your course portfolio or your teaching portfolio. That sense of development, <coughs> that sense that you're reflective, that sense that you're using data of whatever type. It doesn't have to be mathematical data. It could be qualitative data. But you're using the data that you've collected in order to help yourself be a better teacher, in order to help your students learn. So that's what we're looking for in terms of that course part, um, portfolio or the teaching portfolio. Um, you're not going to get in facets if all the student evaluations of teaching are horrid. Mm -hmm. okay? uh, we've gone ba ba back and forth about <coughs> when we want sets as part of the facet da dossier or we don't want sets as part of the facet dossier. We want them. We don't want to admit anyone to facet who the students tell us is a horrible teacher. Um, they're completely fed up with this person. This person's getting horrible sets. That's probably a clue that something's wrong. Now, we have admitted people to FACET who didn't have perfect sets. We do that all the time, especially if they're teaching something in their discipline that's very difficult. In psychology, our students don't like statistics. They don't like the research methods class. I see some smiles. <laughs> Are you here? Are you in psychology? No, I'm, I, don't, I don't teach, but uh, I can remember when I was a student in, in <laughs> statistics <laughs> class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so the first time someone teaches research methods and statistics, their sets just, they go, woo, like that, way down. But then, then, then over time, they improve. Are they ever going to be as high as when a psychologist teaches abnormal? I teach abnormal psychology all the time. The students love abnormal. They come in there. They already love me. Um, I have to sort of do something wrong to make them not love me because they love abnormal. Um, no, probably the, the person who's teaching research methods and statistics never going to have as high of sets as I do in my abnormal class. But that's okay because we all know that research methods and statistics may be more challenging to get those perfect sets. We're not looking for perfect sets. Um, the set data, in my opinion, can work against you. And they don't really help you that much. Does that make sense? It's like if they're really, really low, it's like, ooh, what's going on here? There's a problem here. And then we start looking for other student voice in that dossier. Um, student comments, other things. Um, and if we don't find it, the sets may keep you out of facet, but they typically don't get you in. If that's the only thing you have, you're probably not going to get in fast. Um, peer evaluations. We instituted peer evaluation several years ago. Uh, I don't know how long ago it's been now. Maybe 10 years, I'm not sure. You have to have two peer evaluations. They are not letters of recommendation. What, they, what the peer evaluation letters should do is that they should describe what that peer has observed when they went into your classroom, okay? So they, the peer evaluator actually conducts a peer review. They go into your classroom, they watch you teach. It could be once, it could be five times. We don't care, minimum of once. They have to go into the classroom and observe you teach. It has to be within the past two years. Uh, and then we want them to describe what you did in the classroom. Now, they could add additional information about you, but what we are really looking for is what they observed in your classroom. And that's what the peer review letters should be, the peer evaluation letters. So we don't really need to know anything about the peer reviewer. Um, we don't really need to know um, what the peer reviewer, one of the things that a lot of peer reviewers do is that they will say, well, you know, every time I sit in my office, uh, I can see all of Dr. X's students lining the hallways. Dr. X must be a really good teacher because all his students are always at, in his office. You know, we don't know that. They may always be in his, in his office because Dr. X can't explain anything in class. Or it may, they may always be in his office because Dr. X requires them to come to his office. We don't know. What I, what I do want, what, I, what the peer reviewer could tell me that would be helpful I went to so-and-so's class, 
And on this day, so-and-so was doing X, Y, and Z. When students asked questions, this Dr. X responded this way. I want to know from the peer reviewer what they observed during that class so that I have, hopefully, two other people who are looking at this candidate's teaching and are able to tell me, yes, this person's an excellent teacher. Because let's be honest, anyone can put together a dossier and put things in that dossier that aren't true. They could write a dossier that makes themselves look like they walk on water when they really don't. And how does the statewide committee know? We wouldn't know. We assume that they wouldn't get past the campus level, <laughs> that you guys would catch that. Um, but we don't know. So, that, so, so those peer evaluations make us feel much more secure that what you're telling us is consistent with what the peer with what the peer reviewer has also seen in your classroom. So if you're describing yourself as a very, um, that you always teach using small groups and your classes are very interactive, and both peer reviewers say that you lectured the entire time and you didn't even allow students to, answer, to, to, to ask a question, that inconsistency is something that the statewide committee would want to address. Okay? And that has happened uh, on occasion. <laughs> that someone presented themselves drastically different than what the peer reviewers had seen in the classroom. They got a revise and resubmit. We thought about giving them a reject, but we thought, no, you know, it could have just been a misunderstanding or a bad day or we don't know. We just don't know. And then we're looking at the quality of the faculty-student interaction. What do we mean by that? What are things that attest to quality of faculty and student interaction? One of the things that would be helpful to a statewide committee are comments from the students. And it's best to interweave those comments. So when you're talking about how um, you really require students to engage in critical thinking, you can interweave a comment from a student that supports the fact that you utilize critical thinking tests. So don't just give me a list of student comments. Take a comment and use that comment to emphasize or reinforce something that is in your dossier. Okay. Other things that, huh? Where can you draw those comments from? Like if students send you emails, can you use them? Yes, that? you can. You can use any comments you have from a student, be it an unsolicited comment or a solicited comment. So unsolicited would be like an email. Um, so how do you kind of cite it? You just say, student in my um, abnormal class, student in my P324 class, um, commented X, and there's a quote. Um, solicited comments would be like if on the student evaluation of teaching, there's usually a section where students can write what they liked most about the class or what they liked least about the class. Um, those comments would also be, those would be okay. And I frequently get comments from students who um, they took my classes 10 years ago, and now they're in graduate school, or now they're working, and they'll email me. And those are perfectly acceptable as well. Um, so any of those comments are, are fine. We don't need a list of every comment you've ever received. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we really don't want that. Um, it's much more effective to use the comments where they support your arguments. Okay, use them like they're data, because they are. They're student data. Other things that really speak to the quality of faculty-student interaction would be things like, I have students who do research with me, and um, I have two students right now who will be going to a conference with me in January, and the three of us will, will, will be presenting together at the conference. That speaks to quality of faculty-student interaction. If you are an, an advisor for a student group, that would speak to faculty-student interaction. So all those things that you do with students, if you do advising of students, that speaks to faculty-student interaction. So anything like that that you do, we want to hear about it. That shouldn't be left out of the dossier, because that addresses that faculty-student interaction. And obviously, the more things that you can tell us, you're building a, a, a broader picture 
of what you're like as a faculty member. And the broader that picture is, the stronger that picture is, the more we can get a sense of who you are. And that's what we're looking for, that sense of who you are. And then what we do is for each, so you would get either very strong, strong, weak, or very weak in this category. Okay. And once again, each person on the statewide selection committee completes this rubric for each candidate. So everybody's completing this rubric. So when they walk in that door that day for our statewide meeting, they bring these rubrics already completed. So it's very important when you select someone for the statewide selection committee that they understand that this is a huge time commitment um, in terms of reading all those dossiers, in terms of completing the rubric, and then going to Indianapolis and basically you know, having a day-long event of discussing each candidate. So it is a huge commitment of time, but I think it's really important because we want to make sure that the people we admit to FACET are quality teachers and that we don't overlook someone. So it's very important. Let's see here. The second category that we use, and you can tell this one's a little bit smaller. And one of the questions I always get is, well, are the categories equal? No. That first category is probably the most important category. There has to be excellent teaching. If you don't have everything in, in, in the remaining categories, it's not a big deal. Okay? Um, category one, the excellence in teaching, that's a big deal. It's like a cutoff score for graduate school. I remember when I uh, was applying to graduate school, um, my training is in clinical psychology. And for most of the PhD programs, you have to take the GRE, and the cutoff is 1,200. So if you don't have 1,200, don't bother applying, because they're not even going to look at you. It doesn't matter whatever, whatever else you have. You have to have a 1,200. So we were all like, you know, praying when we got our GRE scores. It was over 1,200. Mm. And because we knew we didn't have a chance of getting in unless we had that 1,200. The same is true here. If you don't have number one, that first category, don't bother applying because you have to be an excellent teacher. Uh, that's what FACET is all about. So the rest, you don't have to have everything. Okay. So this is one of those that we look at, but you don't have to have everything in this category in order to be admitted to FACET. So the first thing on this category is teaching scholarship. So what counts as teaching scholarship? When I say scholarship of teaching, what do I mean by that? peer-reviewed articles about pedagogy. That would count. Is there anything else that would count? Um, what about... Attending workshops? Or? Attending workshops, yes. That counts. What about presenting a workshop on, on campus about teaching? Yeah, that counts. Okay, so we're not talking only about peer-reviewed articles on pedagogy. We're also talking about attendance at teaching workshops. We're talking about presenting teaching workshops, either locally or at national or international conferences. I think sometimes people think, well, I don't have anything in scholarship of teaching. But what we find is that if we talk to them, I probably find five or six things that they had. Um, so don't be, you know, don't be completely narrow about that. We don't expect everyone to have a peer-reviewed article on, on pedagogy. That's just not expected. But we do expect you to be active. We do expect you to be going to teaching workshops, and hopefully you've presented a couple of teaching workshops. Okay? All right. Um, evidence of peer mentoring related to teaching. By this, what we're talking about is that you help other people with their teaching and that you have allowed other people to help you with your teaching. So, that it's, so it's a two-way street. Um, you may have a younger colleague who you've been a mentor 
um, for that younger colleague. Or you may have gone to your campus teaching learning center and had a peer review conducted. Or you may actually be a peer reviewer uh, on your campus. All of that would count under there. So we would look for things under there. And the last one in this area, you can see this area is a little bit smaller. Demonstrated ability to impact others' teaching. And how do we know? We don't know for sure. But if you're a peer reviewer, we would count that. If you're giving a presentation, we would count that. If it's a peer reviewed article, we would count that. Um, I'm not quite sure. <coughs> Sometimes we do have people who have won um, national awards. Um, for their efforts in terms of um, service to teaching, things like that. Obviously, that would count there. We don't expect everybody to have a national award for service to teaching, but those would be the sorts of things that we would look for there. As you can see, there's, there are fewer items in Category 2, and this one's very different than Category 1, and then I keep saying, well, you know, it could be this or it could be that, and I don't, mm -hmm. and we're not going to kick you out if we don't have this. We like to see some effort in this category, uh, but it doesn't have to be everything in this category. Does that make sense? Okay. This one's another big one. <laughs> we have numerous items in this category. This is commitment to continued growth. We don't want people in FACET who view FACET as just another line on their Vita. It's just something to get them promotion or get them tenure or just something that makes them look good to their colleagues. FACET is really an organization about the continual improvement of teaching. We want to not only improve how well our students learn, but we want to help our colleagues improve their teaching, and we want to help the image of teaching across the university and across the nation. So FACET is a multi-faceted, it's a, you know, it has multiple um, goals related to FACET. And so we want to make sure that the people that we admit to FACET aren't just trying to get into FACET to get promoted. That's not what we're looking for. That's one of the reasons you may have noticed that there's a requirement that you must have been at the university for a certain number of years. We don't want people trying to use it um, to get tenure. Now, if they're really, really good, more power to them. They should be able to use it. But we don't want people only doing it for that. Um, all of these are somewhat ambiguous in the sense of what do we mean by evidence of reflection? I'll have some examples of that a little bit later. Uh, what do we mean by demonstrated ability to learn from taking risks? Creativity in pedagogy. Development of, a, I think, development of appropriate learning goals is very clear cut. And evidence of participation in professional development activities related to teaching is also very clear cut. But the first three is where people get in trouble. Evidence of reflection about teaching, demonstrated ability to learn from taking risks, and creativity in pedagogy. Let's take the third one, creativity in pedagogy. Um, if you write your dossier and you say that you're a firm believer in lecture, you go in every day and you lecture, you've used the same notes for 20 years, <laughs> and your students do just fine. You might have a problem. There's nothing there. There, there's, there is very little reflection. There is very little anything. Now, you may be right that lecture could be a very effective technique, but how do you know? Um, we don't see any evidence that you've really thought much about it. So we, at the very least, you have to have reflection. The creativity we love. The creativity is something that we're going to, you're going to get extra points for creativity. It doesn't have to be reinventing the wheel. It could be something, you know, um, relatively minor. Um, but we'd like to see you taking a risk and trying something different. Um, many people who get admitted to FACET 
they are using things that have been published in other locations. The, the, um, the minute papers. That's not new. Um, the pair share. That's not new, um, but it may be new to that person. So it's created from their perspective because it's something they've never tried before. So we're not saying you have to go out there and invent something, although that's cool too. Okay, you know, feel free to try something. But what, but what we do want to see is that you're willing to take that chance. You're willing to do something that takes you out of your comfort zone. And you're doing it because you've seen a need. You recognize, either because of a peer review, or because you've collected data, or because your students are yelling, but you recognize that there is something wrong in what's going on in your class. It is not as good as it could be. You've recognized that. You've sought out some way to change what you're doing. And then you're assessing to see whether it actually works. It's that reflective process. That's what we're looking for. And so by creativity, we're not talking about um, hanging from the chandelier. Okay? We're not talking about doing something that no one has ever done before in the world. But we're talking about doing something that you haven't done before. And not just to do something different, but because there's a need to change from what you've been doing because it's not working. I feel like I've talked a lot about um, participation, professional development activity, but I haven't talked much about appropriate learning goals. And this is the one that sometimes I think people get offended. Well, who's, you know, who are they to say whether my learning goals are appropriate or not? Well, we are your colleagues. And as colleagues, we do have the ability to recognize inappropriate learning goals. We teach. Most of us on the statewide committee have taught for a long period of time. And sometimes we do see inappropriate learning goals. Now, all we can do is, is comment based upon what you give us. So if you tell us the learning goal is I have one here, in fact. Hang on. Okay. This is an actual blurb from a dossier. And it says, in keeping with the objective of having an interactive classroom, I encourage student creativity. Students have engaged in such diverse activities as playing games, making up new words and defining them, going on scavenger hunts, and analyzing the symbolism in an episode of MASH. Let's break this down. Does it sound like a fun class? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I mean, making up new words. We call that neologisms in abnormal psychology. Mm -hmm. That's fun to do. Um, I liked MASH, so I would be more than happy to sit around and talk about MASH. Uh, scavenger hunts are fun. Uh, playing games are fun. All of that sounds like great fun to me. But what's the problem? It doesn't explain what the students are getting out of it. Yeah. What's the learning outcome here? Is it having an interactive classroom? Um, an interactive classroom in and of itself, I don't see where that's going to lead to student learning. What's, what is the student learning outcome here? And how does he know whether they've met it? Um, just simply having an interactive classroom would not be an appropriate learning goal. It has to be connected to something more than just simply having an interactive classroom. It's nice to have an interactive classroom, but this person teaches a content area. Where is the content here? I'm not seeing any. One thing they do on the trustees' awards is they look at your GPA. If you're giving out A+, plus, A+, plus, A+, plus, A+, plus, A+, plus, and the students are having a lot of fun, you, can't, you cannot get a trustees' teaching award here, which I think is really a good thing. So I'm just wondering, are you seeing here that maybe you can have too much fun in the classroom 
and it might show up on the set of Al's that everybody's saying, this is wonderful. We're having a great time playing games, watching match, but we're, <laughs> they're not learning anything, yeah. which I think is what you're pointing out here. Exactly. That, that is what I'm pointing out. Now, we don't look at the grades for the statewide. I um, noticed that. And there's been quite a few discussions about that. Um, my belief is that it would be possible to create a class where the students would have great amount of fun and also learn. Mm -hmm. It's not having fun that's the problem. In fact, I believe that it would be theoretically possible that all the students in your class could just give them A. It's probably never going to happen in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Because I have students who just refuse to show up or they, you know, they don't do the reading or whatever. But I keep thinking, you know, if I could just engage them, that they all theoretically could earn an A. So just because your class is a lot of fun, just because the, your students are doing really well, doesn't mean that you're not a good teacher. Um, but if your class is having a lot of fun and I don't see any connection to substance, that's the problem. And in this particular dossier, this is all this person talked about. This was it. Um, this was their great reflection, their great discussion of what they did. Now they talked more about how they did episodes of MASH. They talked more about how important creativity is. They talked more about the games that they played. But I never got a sense of what the, learning, the student learning outcomes were. I never got a sense of any reflection. I never got the sense here of, was there, I mean, how did this begin? Did they just do this from, you know, from the get-go? Have they always done this? Or did they, once upon a time, did they lecture and the students didn't like it or students were dropping out, so they got a peer review and then they, the peer review suggested that they try to live, you know, they try to engage the students. I get, I get no sense here whatsoever of a process, of a reflective process, of practice based on evidence. I don't get any sense of that here. So for this one, I would say inappropriate learning goal. I don't see an appropriate learning goal here. Yeah, I like to have fun. I like interactive classroom, but that's not my learning goal. <coughs> my learning goal would be something like um, students being able to apply um, psychological concepts to novel scenarios. That's one I use, so I can say that one. Um, are students being able to differentiate, to compare and contrast theories in psychology? Those are learning goals, and I don't see anything like that here. Now, is that judgmental on part of the statewide selection committee? Sure, it's judgmental. But remember, you get to write your dossier. You get to make the argument. So in this case, I don't think this person has made a strong enough argument that they have appropriate <coughs> learning goals. They might. But based upon what I'm reading in the dossier, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing those appropriate learning goals. I'm also not seeing a reflective process. I just don't see it. I don't see a pedagogical practice based upon evidence. And that's what we're looking at. And I'm not seeing it in this one. Now, in terms of creativity, would this one be considered creative? We argued about this quite a bit, actually, mm -hmm. on the statewide committee. Some people saw this as being very creative. Others said, no, it's not creative because it's not geared toward learning. It would have been creative if he could have explained how he used these games to reach <coughs> a particular learning outcome, how he used mash to reach a particular learning outcome. It would have been even better if he would have talked about how the students, um, how well the students did on a particular student <coughs> learning outcome. They didn't do so well. Then he, you know, read something about using mash and so he, so he started using this mash symbolism. Then he reassessed the students and the students got it. 80% of them were now getting it. That would be creative. That would be excellent. That's what we're looking for. 
you're just giving me a long list of all these cool things that you do in your classroom doesn't impress me. That's not what I'm looking for. Although I might like to come over to your class and play. <laughs> it's awfully fun to play. Hi. So this is the sort of thing that we don't want to see. Any questions about this third category? I feel like some of the things we'd already talked about, I didn't go over them in as much detail. Okay. And then the last category on the rubric talks about leadership efforts. What sort of leadership, when we say demonstrated leadership related to teaching, what sort of leadership could you have? that relates to teaching. You mean like a curriculum committee? Or Correct. Committee work that relates to teaching. Anything else? Being asked to lecture on your expertise in other classrooms. Mm -hmm. Very good. <coughs> Anything like that would be leadership in teaching. Um, if you have served as director of your Campus Teaching <coughs> Learning Center. That would be obviously a very high uh, level of leadership related to teaching. But anything along those lines. If you um, initiated a brown bag series relating to teaching, that would be definitely leadership related to teaching. So we're looking for anything along that line. Once again, it doesn't have to be national, doesn't have to be international. It can be campus-based. Uh -huh. um, the teaching that you're evaluating is what you've been discussing is classroom-based. But if some of us are engaged in you know, teaching in the community, holding seminars, educational seminars, et cetera, would you include that in the Definitely. In fact, that would be dip, uh, demonstrated le uh, leadership. Yeah. I would definitely include that. <coughs> You'd want both. Mm. But um, yes, that would definitely apply. I think there was one other thing that I thought that would apply to as well. Let me go back. Um, demonstrated ability to impact others. Okay. Um, that would also kind of go there as well. We double dip. <laughs> Whatever we can find in your dossier that relates, that counts. We will make it count. Um, the, the next one, evidence of potential future contributions to FACET and its mission. There is a place on the um, dossier where they ask you to talk about uh, what you would like to contribute to FACET. How is that worded, Charlotte? It's um, Appendix B, Contributions to FACET Interest Profile. Yes. Page 12. So, you know, we do look at that. We look at how you view yourself as fitting into FACET. And sometimes we have conversations about how we would love for this person to be in FACET because they have so much to contribute. So that's a very important thing is how well you um, describe what you might want to do as part of FACET. Once again, we're, we're not looking for people who just want to add this to their, to their, um, to their curriculum vita. We want people who are going to be active members of FACET. And there's so much to do in FACET. FACET is so broad, um, not just at the campus level, but the statewide level. There are so many things going on that no matter what interests you in relation to teaching, there's something going on that you can get involved with FACET. Um, so if you're not familiar with all the activities, you might want to go to the FACET <coughs> homepage and look at some of the things that are going on in terms of FACET. Every year we have a FACET retreat, and you can present at the retreat. And it's fun the first year to go and just sort of check out what's going on. Um, but um, the whole range of things going on at that FACET retreat. Um, we've been heavily involved with the um, Journal for Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. And so there are several people. I, I serve as a reviewer for that journal. Um, I've published in that journal. So those are opportunities for you as well. There's an associate, fac uh, associate faculty conference every year that FACET's involved with. Um, there is, um, I'm probably forgetting things, Charlotte, so kick in here. Uh, there's the 
uh, facet leadership workshops and so if you're interested in developing your leadership skills I went to the I was talked into going to the Leadership Institute a long long time ago and because um, I didn't view myself as a leader I didn't view myself as someone who would ever be out in front so I went to this leadership institute, sort of under protest, and I discovered that, you know what, there are many different types of leaders. And I was thinking of, you know, this type of leader that's out there and always sort of like self-promoting and everything. And I said, well, that's not me. That's, that's not who I am. They said, yeah, but you're the organizer. You're the one that does all the work and gets everybody else to take sort of center stage. And I said, yeah, that's very comfortable for me. I don't like being center stage, but I'm very good at organizing things. And finding out what your skill is, what your skill is, and getting you to take responsibility for doing that. And I think, you know, there are different types. And then because of that Leadership Institute, um, when our campus was thinking about having a teaching learning center, I became the founding director of that. And was very happy to do that, and was, I think we were very successful in getting that teaching learning center going. And it's still going today. So it's turned into a very successful thing. But I probably wouldn't have done that without FACET and without my FACET colleagues pushing me into going to that Leadership Institute. Because I never viewed myself that way, but they did. Because they could see that there was a different type of leadership than what I, than what I could see. So I think that um, there's lots of different ways to get involved in FACET. There's a statewide steering committee. Your local campus has a committee. Um, you can take my place as chair <laughs> of the statewide <laughs> selection committee. Um, I think it's about time for me to step down someday. <laughs> uh, I started off um, being a representative for my campus, and then when um, Eileen Bender retired and Bob Orr and Sharon Hamilton became um, facet directors, Bob asked me to take over as being the chair of the statewide selection committee, and I. Uh, assumed that I would step down when David Malik became director and he said no you can't <laughs> leave you have to continue doing this so I've done it through David as well so uh, I think it's about time that one of you step up and be the chair of the statewide selection committee because you all now understand it right you understand what we do mm -hmm. so you can be chair of the statewide selection committee and I'll give you my letters <laughs> And then the fourth one, the, the third one um, under category four, and I apologize for my voice. It actually is better today. I thought I was going to have to like do sign language or something today. Yesterday I couldn't talk at all. So this is actually much better. Evidence of past or future institutional change and development in both curriculum and pedagogy. We rarely have anyone who have anything in this area. Um, once again, that first category is an automatic. You have to have everything in the first category. The second category, third category, and this category, we don't, we're not so concerned that you have something in every single one of these. Now, what would be under that one? What do you think might fall under that 4C? If, you're, if your school or college is doing um a revision of a particular discipline's curriculum mm -hmm. and you head that up, um, mm -hmm. or if you're implementing a new type of pedagogy like um, in medicine they use problem-based instruction and if they were doing that and you something like that. Correct. Uh, in nursing, um, I was just thinking last year in, uh, some of the dossiers in nursing talk about this sim lab, this like the sim man, simulated man, a person, I'm not sure what it is. If you're, um, yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, am I being politically incorrect here? Um, it's a simulated person. Yes. And um, so they were had to create everything for this new simulations, and mm -hmm. so they talked about that. That definitely fell under 4C, mm -hmm. and that would be something that's pretty major. Um, if you had to, to create a new major, that would definitely fall under 4C. A mm -hmm. uh, new program, something along those lines, that would definitely fall under 4C. And we don't expect everyone to have that. Um, but definitely we would expect everyone to have some type of demonstrated leadership in relation to FACET. And we would expect everyone to have some sort of view of how they would fit into FACET or what contributions <coughs> they can make to FACET. So those two are probably the ones that you want to focus on and be sure that you have something in those two. That's the rubric.
as you can see, it's, qu it's quite extensive. Um, so every person on the statewide selection committee completes the rubric for every single dossier. And that's where we start. And um, it is quite a long day, but I think it's worthwhile. Because when we finish, we know all sorts of cool things about all of those people. We know what they do. Yeah. At the risk of asking a politically incorrect question, a whole bunch of us sent our applications in last year, and we didn't make it. So I'm not asking you to comment specifically, but can you in general address why this campus had such difficulty specifically on your four issues? Which, which of the ones did you see from this campus that we are deficient in? And I can't speak about any individual dossiers. Right. I'm not asking you to but do that. I can speak in general. And in general, I think the two issues that um, I would want to address would be the evidence of student learning okay. and the reflective process, um, that entire reflective process, which is why I sort of pulled those two out for us to talk in more detail. I know that there was, um, you know, things happened that um, I think there were new liaisons last year. And so it's certainly possible that in that transition um, that our message did not get to you. And that happens. And so I think that um, I think all those people receive revise and resubmit. I don't think anybody received a rejection letter. And I really wanted to emphasize the difference between a revise and resubmit and a rejection letter. A rejection letter is we really don't want to see you again. There is nothing that we saw here that we thought, you know, do you really think you're a good teacher? We don't. <laughs> uh, we didn't send one of those. We sent the revise and resubmit. Because in each case, we felt frustrated that there was material there that was really good, that we thought maybe this person really does belong in FAFSA, but that didn't go far enough. We didn't see enough of the evidence of student learning. We didn't see enough of the reflection. And so, in, and like I said, I can't speak to individual cases, but I can say in general, all four of them, we wanted to see more reflection, more evidence of student learning. Convince me, bowl me over, <coughs> knock me out, convince me that you're an excellent teacher. If you convince me of that, everything else falls into place. But when the committee reads it, they're like, we're not sure. We're not sure if they're an excellent teacher or not. Um, that's where it gets hung up. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Charlotte. I just also would like to add that um, between the committee here and then going to the next committee, there is a process that we go through give, um, where we give recommendations, and that's all they are for strengthening the, because we don't want to send it with things that we know are weak. So we gave, we, and we gave each candidate a listing of things that we thought would improve the dossier. And, and at that second point, we did not, and I don't know if this was an error or not, and you can share that with mm -hmm. us. And again, we were new for the first year, but we did talk to the liaisons ahead of us and got information. We did not on the second read, when they did their resubmit, we sent those forward. Because mm -hmm. at that point, we were at deadline and we felt that People, our advice was just that, advice. We are not in a position to say, do this, do that, do that, or we're not going to send you. That was not the way, we, and that was not the spirit in which we did our recommendations, and it won't be the spirit in which we will do it this year. It was just that we thought, from what we, our experience, being members in there, what we went through as candidates, and what information we got from the past liaisons, that if people addressed those issues that we mentioned, they would have a better chance of being selected. I feel a lot better having listened to this um, presentation that we were on the right track when we gave our advice. What we didn't have enough of was, I guess, concrete examples. Mm -hmm. We had a few dossiers that we shared with people. We had an info session. Everybody did not come, but a number of people came just at this time. Everybody didn't come. It's not a guarantee by coming to the info session that you're going to make it, but it does help. I guarantee you the information that you got today and we got, I took notes like I was going through again, um, will help 
in making that dossier with, and you won't make the kind of mistakes that were made before. And, and we're, we just, we want you to make it. And, 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 I, and I want to add just one thing. It varies from campus to campus. How the campus, um, how the campus committee handles that feedback issue. Right. On my campus, the way it works, and I'm not sure that if, I'm not sure if this is good or, or bad. Okay, just just to let you know that the campuses do differ. On my campus, we begin um, the nomination. Nominations have to be in in the spring. So by the end of the spring semester, we know who the nominees are. We have an information session in the spring. They have to have their dossier, the rough draft, completed early fall, like September. And then the committee, they're appointed a person from the committee who goes over it, a mentor. They have to make the changes. If they don't make the changes, they may not get forwarded. Um, so the committee decides whether they will forward them or not. So not all of the people who are nominated will necessarily be forwarded from our campus. We made a decision a long time ago that we wanted only the strongest dossiers to go forward. Because what happened on our campus in the past was the dossiers would get to the statewide level and I would be embarrassed because they really weren't very strong. No one was looking over them. No one was helping them. And I said, this can't continue. We need to do a better job at the campus level of giving feedback because I don't want people to go to the state level and then to be so disappointed when they don't get admitted to FAFSA. I would rather them be told at the campus level, look, you know, you're a really, really strong teacher, but your dossier doesn't present yourself that way. So I, let's fix the dossier at the campus level so that when it goes to the state, it's going to be a shoo-in. Mm -hmm. And that's what I prefer, uh, but every campus is going to handle that differently. And I think what happened last year is just it, they weren't as strong as, as, as they could have been. Yeah, and I just want to clarify, I really would like to thank mm -hmm. uh, Charlotte and Sabir because they did a wonderful job. Mm -hmm. They gave me feedback, and to tell you the truth, it was my fault. There was an error in my portfolio that I need to work on. And so this has been helpful because Good. I can see uh, what the problem was. But it wasn't uh, from Seidel or Sabir. So they, they, as I said, they really did try to help me. And, you know, I've worked with Charlotte since last year, and I think that you're right. I think, you know, that they are trying very hard to help everybody. And, you know, and there's no guarantees. There's no guarantee right. on my campus. <laughs> uh, every year the statewide committee is composed of different individuals. Uh, the chair stays the same. Um, but, and, we, and we have the same rubric, but the people who are evaluating are humans. Okay. And so their opinion of what one person has written may be different than the opinion of somebody else. Uh, but I think there is some consistency because we are using the same rubric. <coughs> I'm the chair. I'm not going to let it get out in left field. Um, I'll just keep them talking until they come around to my viewpoint. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's just like... Oh, well, why do you think that? You know, I saw this in the dossier. And we just keep talking. And um, it's very rare that we don't have, cons well, we have to have consensus. It's very rare when we don't have um, almost everybody feeling comfortable with, with, the, with the decision that's made. And it was hard last year. I mean, the statewide committee was very concerned um, about Northwest last year. Trust me, it was rough being there watching every <laughs> other campus present what we had none to present, except that there was someone who hadn't gone up last year, the year before. They weren't at this setting, so they presented it, and we were able to have someone go up from Northwest, but it, it felt like the whole time I wanted to go like that. And I, and I know we tried our best, but, you know, the thing is that's great, I think, is we know you on campus, and we know the kind of work you do. And, yeah. and I, I like what you said about... Um, you can be the best teacher, you can be excellent and doing all those wonderful things, but if the case isn't made for the people who don't know you and the dossier has to kind of stand alone on itself. Yes, and that I, piece I think that's that the most really important helpful. thing to understand is that really we only have the dossier. And I have seen dossiers come to my campus. Well, I know this person's a wonderful teacher. They, I think they're phenomenal. And their dossier is flat. There's nothing in there. There are no examples. There's nothing to make even I, – I couldn't call them excellent based upon their dossier. So it, it really is important that everything be in that dossier and that you pr convince me. Convince me that you're excellent. Give me something that I can hang on to, that I can be convinced. 
speaking about reflection, I have two more examples, and I want to go through those, and then I'm willing to take any questions you have, uh, address any concerns you might have, um, but I do want to go over the last two examples of reflection. The first one, I think that we all agreed was pretty bad, right? This was not what we want to see. So read the second one. Tell me what you think of this one. What did they do well here? Charlie? Admitted that there was a problem, that they addressed the problem. Mm -hmm. As they looked at some, they actually collected some data to show that there was some growth. Um, so there seems to be, at least in part, this reflective process. They started with a problem, mm -hmm. they addressed the problem, and they collected data, and things improved. What's missing? Reflections on the sixty percent, the forty percent that aren't doing, responding this way. Mm hmm Yeah, definitely. Is sixty percent still not where I would want to be? Um, well, many what's data, going on? There's uh -huh. set data. There's only set data presented. Mm -hmm. Not. Here's how the exams got better. Plus, what did they do? <coughs> Bingo. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> what did they do? Yeah. I don't have any sense of what they really did. And I would like to see that. So this is better than the first one, right? Mm -hmm. This is a step in the right direction. And in fact, we are so greedy. Mm -hmm. We are so, you know, we're just desperately needy for student outcome data <laughs> at the statewide level. We would love this. Mm -hmm. This is not ideal. But this is so much better than what sometimes we get that this would be something that I would be very happy with. It's not perfect. You guys can do better than this. But even this is more than what we typically get at the statewide level. Now look at this one. I'm sorry it's so long, but in order to get it all on there, and I, and I did cut out a lot of it. And actually, this is from one of the examples in the handbook of what to do right. So you have the full uh, blurb on this in your handbook, in the FAFSA handbook. What's right about this? Well, it tells the story from beginning to end with Arvid and Sam. It tells the story from beginning to end. And it tells me where they began, what was, wrong, you know, what was going on that was wrong. It tells me exactly specifically what the problem was, what they chose to do about the problem, and how that solution impacted the students um, in their learning, and how it impacted the, the faculty member as well for their own self-reflection. This is a great example of, of what I would like to see. Could it be better? Sure. I've, I've never seen anything written that couldn't be better. Um, you know, even the Constitution, you know, we're still trying to tinker <laughs> with it. Uh, everything could be better. But this is beautiful. This is what I would like to see, this type of specificity. I feel like I know her. I feel like I could, you know, if, if I saw this person teaching, I'd say, oh, that's her. Because I could see what she's doing. I get a sense of who she is as a teacher. This is what I would like to see in your dossier. I want to know who you are as a teacher. And I'm hoping that who you are as a teacher is someone who focuses on evidence. And what you do in the classroom is based upon that evidence. And that you're constantly trying to improve your teaching. And that your student outcomes are appropriate. That's what we're looking for. 
questions? You guys have weird doors. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that. <laughs> Was there anything I didn't answer for you? Mm -hmm. Peer evaluators. Um, sh who should we ask? How? Do you have any advice to offer about that? I would recommend that it's a facet member. It does not need to be an administrator. In fact, I would advise you to stay away from administrators. Um, I would ad advise a, a facet member. And um, as long as they are willing to come into your class, that's all that is really necessary. And that they understand that what you want is not a letter of recommendation, but a letter that describes your teaching, what you actually do in the classroom. So if you've had somebody do a peer review for you in the past, that might be a good person to start with. Um, the reason I say a facet member is because I think they have a better idea of what we're looking for. And we tend to find that letters written by facet members tend to be better letters. Um, the only problem we sometimes have is that, is that they think it's a letter of rack, and so they just simply write about how wonderful you are, and they never describe your teaching. Mm -hmm. So as long as they describe your teaching, uh, you're probably going to be pretty safe. And I would start with somebody who's already done a peer review for you. I think that um, just the difference you just made is a critical one that, that I know my, for myself. I did, wasn't aware of that last year. Okay. I thought that they were letters of recommendation but focused on teaching, and that's going to help me um, help other people that are asking. Yeah, and I, I, I didn't know that. And I think it can't help but be kind of both. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think faculty can write a letter without making it be a letter of rec. But as long as they have that description of their teaching in there, this is that description of what they saw when they went into the classroom. And we don't want, okay, it, uh, I went into the classroom and at 9.15 they closed the door. Mm -hmm. At 9.16 <laughs> they said X. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're talking about. But um, during this class she had students doing this. Mm -hmm. And the students obviously enjoyed this. They were talking and they were engaged and that's the type of detail that I want. Okay. And I think um, um, you've served on the, have you served on the statewide committee? Mm -mm. No? Okay. ISDOC is the person who's I'm most sorry? recent. ISDOC also? I don't remember okay. um, who most recently. But I, I think that all the statewide committee members would tell you mm -hmm. that um, we want to know who you are as a teacher. Mm -hmm. and so that letter needs to describe your interactions with your students, what you're like in that classroom. And then one thing we haven't talked about, I've sort of been talking like everybody teaches face-to-face -face classrooms. It doesn't have to be face-to-face -face classrooms. It could be hybrid classes. It could be completely online classes. It could be one-on-one -on -one teaching. It doesn't matter, but we do need that observation. So how do you observe an online class? You give the peer reviewer access to your online course, and they can go on and look. They can go on and see the interactions between you and the students, the interactions between, between student and student in the online course. So I'm not restricting this just to face-to-face -face teaching. The peer review can be uh, any type of class. The faculty member can be teaching any type of class. But they have to be teaching. They can't be someone who hasn't taught in five years. Mm -hmm. um, that would not work. What can I tell you that would make the process easier or more clear? Is there anything that I've left out? And I know you've missed some. So if you so so if you have particular questions, I would still feel free to ask them. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.